welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. Good morning, afternoon, everybody. I hope you uh, you all had a, a fantastic uh, Christmas, and that you are looking forward to a uh, to the rest of the weekend, New Year's uh, New Year's weekend. So uh, hopefully. Uh, Hopefully you'll enjoy a great uh, New Year's Eve, a great New Year's, and um, yeah, it's a, it, this is a great time, a great time for, for, for reflection, a great time to look uh, back at, at the previous year and kind of, you know, what worked, what didn't work in one's own personal life and in the, in, the world of, uh, in the world around us, and it's a great time to set goals for the next year. It's a great time to look forward and uh, try to assess What's going to happen next year? Uh, where one can um, become a better human being, uh, live a better life. You know, I'm big on, I'm big on uh, living the best that you can, being the best that you can be, and living the best life that you can live. New Year's, New Year's, the 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 period between Christmas and New Year's, a great time to sit back and think and contemplate and consider. What what does it take? How do I become? better? How do I become the best that I can be? How can I live the best life possible to me? And how can I take advantage? How can I exploit the, the changes that are happening in the world around us? So uh, I encourage you all to, to do that this, uh, this coming, uh, these, the, the next few days, this weekend. This is a great weekend for contemplation, for thinking, for planning, for, you know, setting those goals for the new year. And, and I'm not just talking about you know, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to go and exercise. It, it, it's funny how how uh, gym memberships rise dramatically in the in the month uh, after New Year's, and then nobody goes to the gym. No, I'm talking about really taking seriously what it's going to take to make your life better, to live a better 2018 than a 2017, and set yourself up for a great decade, for a great life. So. Uh, Great time to, to be thinking about those things. And of course, also a good time to think about the past. What did I do well? What did I do poorly? What mistakes did I make? How do I rectify the mistakes? How do I do better you know, in 18 than 17? I'm, I'm a big advocate of, of learning from one's mistake. I'm a big advocate for trying constantly to become better, to live a better life, to be a better person, to be the best that you can be, to take your happiness, take your happiness seriously. I actually had a, a great discussion yesterday with uh, Tara Smith, a uh, philosophy professor, on happiness. We spent an hour talking about happiness, what it means uh, and how to, how to achieve it and what one needs to do in order to achieve it and why one is worthy of achieving happiness. So um, that was a great discussion yesterday. It'll go up on my podcast uh, in the coming days. Look for it. It'll also go up on YouTube in the coming days. So look for that. You can find all the latest stuff going on uh, that, I, that I'm putting out there on yaronbrookshow.com, yaronbrookshow.com. Uh, you can find all the uh, great stuff. And, and again, uh, philosopher Tara Smith and I discussed happiness yesterday. Great conversation, very positive. And, uh, and very worthwhile. So I hope you'll all uh, watch it, listen to it when it comes out in the, next, uh, in the next few days. So yeah, a time for contemplation, a time for looking back, and a time for looking forward. So we're going to do a little bit of that today. Uh, we're going to look back at our world, our culture, our, our politics, our, you know, our, and, and uh, what worked and what didn't work in 2017. I don't know. I, the thought that crossed my mind is I'm mainly going to talk about what didn't work because I think that was more important. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit. I don't know how much time we'll have. We're going to talk a little bit about 2018, my expectations for 2018, my hopes, my fears for 2018. So we're going to look backwards. We're going to look forwards. We're going to take this year uh, and, and review it. And, um, you know, and, and hopefully, hopefully this will be a value. Hopefully we can learn from this. Hopefully we can benefit from this and 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 uh, and all you know adjust for the coming year and and get more motivated and more uh, I don't know more incentivized for the coming year. All right, let's uh, so let's jump in. Uh, let's jump into. Uh, well, actually, I'm not going to jump in. Yep, stop. 
I'm looking at my outline. That's not where I'm supposed to go. Before we really jump into to next year, I want to I want to give you a I want to set this up because I want to give you a context. We're going to talk culture, we're going to talk politics, and I want to explain to you where I am coming from, what I believe, and I'm going to do this briefly because I think a lot of you know this, but also um, because I, I really want to get into the analysis of, the, the, of of last year, and we could go on in terms of what I believe for a very very long time. There were hours and hours and hours of me discussing what I believe all over the place that you can find. But in the context of culture, in the context of politics, in the context of analysis, analyzing politically and culturally what happened in this last year, I, I, I want you to tell, I want you, I want to explain what, what my standards are. Now, my standards are high. I am a believer in the founding principles of this country. I am a believer in America. Not just America as a bromide. Not just America as a slogan, as I think it has become, you know, make America great again, America first. But what does America mean? What does America represent? In my view, America represents, America means its founding principles. America is unique among all the nations in the world, not in its geography, not even in the composition of its people, but what makes America special, what makes America unique, what is American exceptionalism are the principles on which it was founded, on the ideas that made this country the greatest country in human history, the only moral country in its founding in human history, the ideas as articulated by our founding fathers in our Declaration of Independence and in our Constitution and in the Federalist Papers and in the writings of those great, great men of the founding. And I think it's too easy to forget in the back and forth of left and right, how far we have come from those founding principles. And I want, before we get into my analysis of Donald Trump and of the Dem Republican and Democratic parties and of our culture that we live in, I want us to remember where we come from. Those of us who emigrated here, I'm an immigrant, as you know, have chosen this country, not because of Donald Trump, not because of Republicans and conservatives and Democrats. I at least chose this country because of the founding principles on which it was established. And it's sad, it's sad for me that those of you who have been who were born here have so easily given up on those principles, so easily drifted away from those principles, so easily forgotten what those principles are. And I've said this on the show before, I think that basically two foundational ideas at the core of the founding of America, two foundational ideas at the core of that era in human history. This is a, the, 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 the founding of America was a culmination of the Enlightenment, it was a culmination of a very intellectual period. And, and in, a, in a world in which we live in today, which is anti-intellectual, anti-elites, America was founded by the intellectual elite of its time. Let me say that again. America was founded by the intellectual elite of its time. I don't think most people in America at the time had an understanding of what the founders did. I don't think that a majority of Americans necessarily even supported the War of Independence. Not clear. Suddenly, a large minority opposed it. And yet, this intellectual elite founded on, uh, grounded in great ideas, grounded in a confidence that their ideas would create a fantastic future, were willing to declare war on the mightiest military force in human history at the time in order to bring those ideas to reality. And what were those ideas? The fundamental idea was that the individual, individual human being has the ability to reason, to think, and therefore to live his own life for himself. He does not need a king. He does not need a council. He does not need a government to dictate to him how to live, what to think, what to do with his life. We are all, as individuals, capable of living our own lives, of examining reality, discovering the truth. And the founders were big on truth. The founders were big on reality. The founders were big on reason, on man's capacity, on every individual's capacity to reason, 
to think for himself and therefore to be left alone, to be left free, free of coercion, free of the government interfering. So reason is the, is the, is the core idea of the founding and a second to that, it's political impl implementation and that is the idea of individual rights, the idea of, idea of individualism, the idea of the sanctity of the individual, the individual as an end in himself. The idea that government's only role, only role, is to protect us, to defend us, to protect us from crooks and criminals and fraudsters and people who would steal our stuff, people who would defraud us. So our government was created to protect individual rights, and that's it. It was not created to provide welfare. It was not created to regulate and subsidize and control. It was created to leave us alone. So the two founding principles of this country was a deep respect for ideas, a deep respect for reality, and a deep respect for truth. In other words, a deep respect for reason. And secondarily, a deep respect for the individual. Individualism and reason are the two founding ideas, founding principles on which this country was established. They animate the Declaration of Independence. They animate the Constitution. They animate the separation of powers. They animate the whole approach to government, to culture, to life that the founding fathers left us with. Now, that legacy has been attacked over and over again by the left and the right for decades, really, you know, almost, <laughs> almost from the, since the, the ink and the Constitution dried, it's been under attack. And that attack has suddenly intensified and been successful over the last hundred years. And it's been led primarily by the progressives and the left, and has been systematically driven, we have systematically driven our government away from those founding principles. But I have to say that I think the 2007-17 is a new low, a new low in the attack on the founding principles of this country. All right, to talk about why that is, to talk about how do I justify that? That's insane, Iran. We will come back after this message. You're listening to Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, we're back. The last show of 2017. Time just <laughs> time just flies. Um, it wasn't it wasn't too long ago. I was doing a year in review for 2016. So uh, here we are, in the end of 2017, going into 2018. Uh, 2018 is going to be an exciting year for me. I'm, I'm busy here uh, packing. Uh, I'm not revealing where I'm moving to yet, but uh, we are packing, leaving tomorrow. I will start the new way in the new year in a new location to be disclosed later this week. All right. Um, so in reviewing 2017, I want you to remember that my standard is, my standard is the funny fathers. And... My standard is, are we moving towards those ideals of reason and individualism and freedom and the Constitution and the Declaration and individual rights and thinking and an intellectual elite that understands these principles? Or are we moving away from that? That is, that is basically my standard. That is how I evaluate the you know the passage of the years and unfortunately almost every year almost every year really every year since i've been in the united states for 30 years now um 30 plus years every year we have moved away from those principles so i i have no i have no positive experiences of yes we're moving in a positive direction i mean there've been some positive things that have happened but mostly we're slip sliding away, to quote uh, Paul Simon, 
Uh, we're slip sliding away from freedom. We're slip sliding away from individual rights. And we are suddenly slip sliding away from reason, from respect for the mind, for respect for the intellect. And again, I think this year saw us uh, maybe a little oil in that slide, slip sliding maybe faster than usual. So let me start by saying a few things that happened that are good this year, um, politically, culturally. I really can't think of anything. Um, some good things, some good things uh, politically, economically. Uh, you know, we've definitely seen some, some uh, progress on deregulation. We've certainly seen, it, particularly when it comes to environmental regulations, we've certainly seen some progress on, on energy. Uh, you've seen uh, specifics, particulars, and with regard to uh, Perry's energy department is, is doing and supposedly going to do uh, good things. You know, financial regulations, probably not so much. Uh, we've seen a stock market that's, that's going up. Why it's going up is a different question. Whether they're going up bodes well for the future or not is hard to tell. But, uh, but you know, if you were in the stock market, you, you made good money this year. You did okay, almost 20% return. Uh, we're generally seeing a, a loosening up of, of, uh, of, in many parts of the regulatory world, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a loosening up. And, and generally, if you look around, you can see a lot of pockets of positivity economically, business-wise, innovation in this country continues. I continue to be uh, a huge fan of Silicon Valley and their continued ability to innovate and to make our lives better in spite of being ridiculed and harassed by left and right who hate their guts, who want to break them up, who want to regulate them to death, who want to sick the Justice Department and the antitrust division on them. And yet, we keep seeing new products in, in healthcare, in biotech, in uh, in technology, I mean, it really is stunning. Some of the some of the achievements, uh, particularly on genetic engineering, uh, the use of CRISPR, this gene editing technology, which is going to revolutionize revolutionize healthcare in, in our future. Uh, the the great advancements in what's called artificial intelligence. I hate to give it that to use that name, but but on on kind of a, a better programming that that learns that. Uh, that is able to come to, to use big data, to come to fantastic conclusions and innovations. Big steps forwards in, in robotics. We're going to see we're going to see robotics implemented in lots of industries and in, in lots of ways to improve our lives and to raise our standard of living. So uh, you know the vast improvements of technology, you know over, I mean, this is so much more important in many respects than anything that happens in Washington, D.C. This is so much more important than Zuckerberg's political views or any of the technology CEO's political views. These companies and people are making our lives better in profound ways. Biotech companies have the potential to make our lives, to, to allow us to live longer, healthier, better lives like, like never before. Uh, and... To ignore that as the real positive. I, I mean, American industry generally, in spite of the Great Recession, in spite of the regulations, in spite of everything, in spite of the uncertainty, in spite of everything, continues to astound in its ability to produce and create. In spite of Donald Trump's negativity about manufacturing, we manufacture today in the United States more stuff than we have ever manufactured in the United States and continue to do so. We just do it with fewer people. You know, think of the fracking revolution. How much has that changed your life? Dramatically. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And do you care what the politics are of the CEOs of the fracking companies? I don't. I admire them for having done what they did, no matter what their politics are. Now, uh, yeah, everybody's going to say they're probably on the right. I, I don't know. But the point is that the brightest spot, the brightest aspect of American society over the last 30 years has been its businesses, 
have been its corp- evil corporations. It's been its entrepreneurs. The ability of American business to rebound from recession, the ability of American business to continuously innovate, the ability of American business to find ways around regulations so that they don't hamper their productivity, the ability of American business, in spite of all that we have put upon it, in spite of the taxes and the regulations and controls, and in spite of the attempts by Donald Trump to be, uh, you know, central planner in chief, particularly early in, in, in his presidency. In spite of all of that, wow, we continue to innovate, grow, produce, employ, create wealth on, on, a, on, a, on a massive scale. One could only imagine, one could only imagine how much we could be producing, how much we could be creating, how much we could be innovating. If, if our economy was truly free, if our economy was truly free. So, uh, yeah, in this new year, say thank you to the innovators, to the entrepreneurs, to the creators, to the builders, to the employers, to the businessmen who drive the U.S. economy, to the businessmen who create and build in spite of politicians, in spite of politics, in spite of culture, in spite of what's taught in the universities, the greatest thing about America, the greatest thing about America are its businessmen. The greatest thing about America are its producers, its innovators, its entrepreneurs. I love America because of the, of the energy, the excitement, the, 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 the productiveness, the imagination, the innovation of Silicon Valley in spite of its politics. That's what makes America great today. I mean, I love America because of the founders, but given that they are gone and their ideas to a large extent are long gone from the political life, from the intellectual life of this country, what we've got left are the people who built this country, who made this country, who created the wealth that we all enjoy, and that is business. So, you know, reflect a little bit. That's a good time to reflect on all the good stuff, on on the wonders of Amazon, on, you know, you'd like to, course Facebook all the time I know but think of all the 30. time you spend there and the enjoyment you get out of it think of your of everything that Apple has created think of fracking think of all 20 the amazing things that exist in our world because businessmen and entrepreneurs have created all right we're going to take a break you're listening to your own book show on the blaze yeah. radio network we'll be right back all right, we're back. And, uh, you know, I'd love to talk about all the positives from last year all day long and pull out all the gadgets that I bought and all the cool stuff and, and encourage you to call in about all the good things that happened to you during the year. But, but you know what? Let's get real. Uh, as much as business and as much as entrepreneurs and innovators gave us a, 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 a good year, nowhere as good as it could be if we had real free, free markets and freedom, the year was not a good year. The year was not a good year because we're just not living in a good period of time. This country is slip sliding away. It's deteriorating. We're heading towards an abyss. I don't know what that abyss will look like. I don't know when it happens, but we're heading there, unfortunately. I think it's going to be both an economic abyss, but it's certainly going to be a cultural abyss. And I really do think that the presidency of Donald Trump, to a large extent, is, is a game changer, a, a new manifestation, a new form of this slip sliding away, a, 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 a corruption that I don't know how this, how this country recovers from. In spite of the positives his administration has done, particularly in the area of deregulation, I think that Trump has basically attacked the very foundational principles of America in a way and in a style that has never been done before and in an explicit way that has never been done before. So that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the show, except for the, for the uh, last section, which we will talk about, hopefully, if we have time, talk about next year. Now, if you want in a conversation, if you, if you want to argue with me or defend Trump or defend uh, 
defend uh, what's going on in the world, then call 1-88-900-3393. 1-88-900-3393. Please keep it to this topic, the topics we're discussing. Um, and, uh, you know, we will, in the final segment, open it up to any questions you want. Uh, a moment of reason we have here on the Iran Book Show, every show. Uh, but 888-900-3393 is the number you can call in with any questions or, or comments that you might have. Um, and let me also say, before I get into, uh, into this, uh, in two weeks, I'll be in New York City. I don't know how many listeners we have in New York City. Probably not the strongest area for the Blaze Radio Network. But uh, if we have listeners from New York City, I am going to be in New York on uh, January 16th for a debate. Uh, and I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun and, and it's going to be really interesting. I'm debating a real powerhouse. I'm debating Gene Epstein, who is the... Uh, I think, uh, uh, editor of uh, Barron's Magazine. So uh, a really, um, he's the economics and books editor of Barron's. Uh, so uh, a real intellect. And uh, we're debating a philosophical issue, which is going to be fun, but a moral philosophical issue. We're going to debate selfishness. Is it a virtue? So uh, I'm going to be defending the resolution that selfishness, self-interest is a virtue He's going to be against that resolution. And we have a great moderator. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the moderator. The moderator of the debate is going to be Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge Andrew Napolitano, who at the age of, I think, 14, read The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand. So Judge Napolitano, who read The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand, he might be on my side on this debate, at least partially. He's also a good Catholic, so I don't know. But he might be on my side on this debate, or maybe he'll be a good moderator. He'll be a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, we will see. But it should be a, a fun event, a fun debate. You can find out information. You can buy tickets. Uh, you have to reserve in advance uh, on uh, the SohoForum.org. The SohoForum.org. And I know that it's kind of getting sold out. Uh, last I heard, there weren't a lot of tickets left. So uh, go get your tickets, reserve them, uh, and make sure you... Uh, you come if, if you're in the New York City area. I think it's going to be a fun evening and um, it'll be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. I'm up against two, uh, you know, Epstein's a serious challenger. And I think uh, Judge Napolitano is, uh, is uh, you know, he's, he's going to stick his uh, opinions in there uh, in the middle of it all. So it should be, it should be a good, good event, a lot of fun, uh, quite entertaining. All right, so what... Let's go back to, um, let's go back to uh, what is it about the Trump presidency? And, and look, in reviewing 2017, Trump is the center figure of 2017, should have easily been man of the year in every publication. He, uh, he set the terms of debate. Everything in 2017 has been either him or response to him. Uh, you know, he has dominated the year uh, like few presidents have. And, um, and, and, and I think that's, I think so. My discussion of 2017, looking back, is going to be dominated by a discussion of Donald Trump. So what is it about Donald Trump's presidency that I find so offensive, if you will? There are two things that he challenges. What Donald Trump challenges explicitly and in his behavior and in what he says and in what he argues for is reason, fact, reality, truth. His is the most explicitly mindless administration, anti-intellectual administration, anti-reason administration ever. Now, Lots of administrations have been anti the mind, anti mind. Lots of administrations have lied. Lots of administrations, almost all administrations, particularly in the modern era, have deceived, have corru were corrupt, were, were, were you know, argued for, f for fakery, for falsehood, you know, thrived on emotion over reason. But most of them disguised it. Most of them disguised it behind a facade, at least, of intellectuality, behind a facade of 
with truth seekers, behind a facade of reason. Trump is the first president who relishes his primacy of consciousness, the idea that his that whatever happens is his mind is reality. The first president who relishes his lying. The first president who's proud of his anti-intellectuality. He's proud of the fakeness of, of what he preaches. He never apologizes. He never, when he, when he lies, he lies blatantly. He doesn't try to disguise this as anything. He's the first president who fully embraces his emotionalism. Doesn't hide it anymore. Doesn't pretend it's something else. And in this, he has taken the, 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 all the deceit that we have experienced, all the mindlessness that we have experienced for 100 years in politics. And now it's just blatantly out there. Now, I mean, this could go either way. This could go in the direction of, oh, that's horrible. And we re reject it uh, as a culture and embrace, embrace um, the opposite. Embrace reason and intellectuality and, and facts and reality and reason. Or we can say, well, yeah, there is no reality. There is no truth. It's all fake. Conspiracy theories are just as legitimate as, any, as anything else, as any factual analysis. There is no one interpretation of history. There's whatever you feel like it. There is no truth in economics. There's whatever you convince people, you can convince people of. And I fear that that's what the culture is embracing. Now, the culture is embracing that because the left has prepped it. Postmodernism has prepped it in that sense. Trump is the first postmodern president. More so than Obama, more so than anybody on the left. Because he is living it. He's truly expressing the idea that reality doesn't matter, right? How many, you know, more people attended my inauguration than any other president. And here are the photos to prove it. The photos actually prove the exact opposite. Doesn't matter. He doubles down. It doesn't matter because I believe more people were there. Therefore, that is the truth. Therefore, I expect those of you who are loyal to me to agree with me, even though the evidence, as even I present them on the wall in the White House briefing room, show that he's wrong. He is embracing lying. He's embracing non-reality. He is embracing everything our professors at the universities have been teaching us. Reality doesn't exist. Facts are not facts. I mean, Clinton started this off by, he was, the, he was like, he started this up, but in a kind of relatively mild manner as compared to Trump. You remember what he said? Well, it depends on what is, is. Right? He was already hinting at this, you know, uh, uh, postmodernist interpretation of language and of reality and what facts are. And Trump has doubled down on this completely. Completely double down on this. So, you know, the, the, the facts are irrelevant to this White House. And they don't even pretend to care about facts. They don't even pretend to care about truth. That's what makes this administration truly unique. It's embraced the philosophy, in many respects, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, out there leftists fully, wholeheartedly, in the name of, I don't know, in the name of America, America first, make America great again? I don't know. All right. Uh, it's time for another break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk more about mindlessness, the fact that we live in a, you know, that this administration is, a, is an administration cultivating the mindless. You're listening to your Unbook Show on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be right back. All right, we're talking about the era of mindlessness that I think uh, Donald Trump has launched. And, and the fact that he has made lying not something to be embarrassed about, not something to apologize 
But just something that if it works, go for it. If, if, he manage, if you can lie to manipulate people, cool. Um, and, and from day one, from day one, from the crowd size to a statement that there was carnage in the streets of America when, you know, uh, uh, violent crime is almost at all-time lows, to almost every time he opens his mouth, he lies. And he doesn't care. And nobody seems to care. That's what's scary. It, you know, every politician lies. All politicians lie all the time, right? But people seem to care about the lies. They call them on them. They criticize them for them. Some politicians will even apologize for having misspoken. But Donald Trump doesn't care. And, and the right, as represented by Donald Trump, doesn't care because they're complete pragmatists. Whatever works, whatever gets them power or gets them control or gets them whatever end they want, that's what they'll do. Lying works to Donald Trump. So he's going to continue to lie. He's going to continue to lie. Now, what that reflects about our culture, what that reflects in terms of how we're educating our kids, what that reflects in terms of the future of this country, I mean, you fill in the blank. But you know, whether it's carnage in the streets or the greatness of the first year of his presidency. It's all alternative, re alternative reality. But he doesn't care. He doubles down on it time and time and time again. Stock market is at all-time highs, true. But actually, stock market did better in the first year of Obama than it did in the first year of Donald Trump. And you know what's amazing to me? When I said that on Facebook a few days ago, that the number of people who told me I was distributing fake news because that's their response to anything they don't like is to attack, which is what they've learned from Donald Trump again, to lie. And when people show you you've lied, it's to attack them, not to apologize, not to change your mind, not to provide alternative facts, no, to attack them. That's where we are. That's where we are. And it's, it's, you know, it's really, really bad. I mean, I'll give you, and, and, and the, the sad thing is the conservatives and Republicans are towing the line. They're not calling him on it. They're not calling anybody on it. They're buying into this. You know what? Because it works. It's giving them power. And what they're really about is power. They're not about the truth. They're not about what's good for the country long term. They're about themselves achieving power and destroying the Democrats. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not that opposed to the second, destroying the Democrats. But in the name of what? In the name of power? You know, I could go for the Democrats if it was just about power. Ah, right? This is all about short-term gains. This is all about pure pragmatism. No principle. Getting where you needed to. You remember... Remember, Donald Trump was a, tr was a truther. There was a period in which he was the leading advocate of a conspiracy theory against President Obama. Now, Obama was a bad president, but so what? Y you don't fight him through conspiracy theories. And everybody's forgotten that. So when we have a million conspiracy theories going on around us, I mean, the president of the United States is a, is a spread of conspiracy theories. There is no... Truth, truth means nothing today. And nobody calls him on it. Nobody suddenly from his own party calls him on it. I'll give you an example. His chief of staff, this whole Charlottesville thing, but his chief of staff, because of the monuments of everything, came on and basically said, well, you know, it's too bad that in the Civil War, they, they didn't just compromise. Really, it, it wasn't, they weren't that far apart. It wasn't that bad. Really? Are you nuts? The Civil War was about slavery, one of the most disgusting, evil institutions in human history. And finally, America was ready to get rid of slavery. There's no compromise around slavery. What do you compromise about? Right? And he's basically saying, yeah, let's not exaggerate. It's, it's no big deal. Let's not overdo it here. Really? And did anybody on the right call him out on this? Did anybody among the Republicans say, 
wait a minute, that's fake news. That's real fake news. That's important fake news. That's fake news historically that really matters. And again, you're buying Kelly and the whole Trump administration into the left's view of history. It's whatever you want. It's whatever you make up. It's whatever you want to perceive it as. Really? And, you know, not to mention Trump's own response to Charlottesville. Oh, there's some good people marching there. Really? Good people marching with neo-Nazis? I don't know any good people who march with neo-Nazis. I don't know any good people who march with KKK. You you don't go into the street if a neo-Nazi is marching. If you're a good person. You stay home. Even if uh, you agree with something that they might be marching, you stay home. I'm not saying everybody who opposes taking down the statues of the, uh, of the um, Confederacy are neo-Nazis or white supremacists. They're not. But you stay home. You don't march with them. If it's their march, and it was their march, you don't. But for Donald Trump, ah, there were good people there. There were good people there. On both sides, because everything's moral equivalency, counterfactual. Hey, it's, sorry, <laughs> it's a new low. And the sad thing is that he's making a correct point. He's making a correct point about the fake news in the media or the bias in the media. I don't like to call it fake news, bias. The media's biased, NPR's biased, CNN's biased. New York Times is biased. So is Breitbart and so is uh, Fox. They're all biased. And it's good to bring that out. But when you're a liar, when your method of communication is through lying, then what claim, what moral high ground do you have when discussing fake news? Two minutes. You have no moral high ground. What alternative are you presenting when you yourself are producing fake news and conspiracies? What are you giving the American people as hope? Nothing. And therefore, all the American people now are is cynical. Yeah, the New York Times is bad. The president lies. Everybody lies. Everybody lies. Maybe reality is whatever we feel like it to be. And this undercuts. It undercuts one of the founding principles of this country, the efficacy of reason, the importance of truth, of facts, of reality. This is the founding of America comes at the end of the age of reason, the enlightenment with the respect for reality and facts and evidence and truth and the human mind. And yet we have an administration that is negates the human mind And we have a university system, an intellectual leftist establishment that negates the human mind. What's left of this country? This is what scares me. What is left when in politics and in academia, politics and academia, reality doesn't matter. Facts don't matter. Reason doesn't matter. The human mind doesn't matter. 20. And... The people who attacked Donald Trump and Donald Trump are all basically advocating fundamentally the same thing, the Ten. negation of reality and reason. All right, you're listening to Iran Book Show. We've got another hour to go. We'll be right back on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, welcome back. For those of you who are back from the first hour, welcome. For those of you who just joined us, this is Iran Book on the Blaze Radio Network. We're talking about uh, the year in review and really talking about what this presidency means, because if you look back at 2017, uh, Donald Trump dominates the news. He is 2017. Uh, Whether it's because people are responding to him or he's responding to events, he is everywhere and everything. And I'm pointing out how mindlessness, how anti-reason, anti-intellectuality, anti-thinking, anti-facts, anti-reality, this administration is, and this administration positioned itself um, and it's really in everything that he's done, in everything that he's done, whether it's, um, you know, uh, the statements he made um, 
you know, about about crime early on in his presidency, of course, which were completely bogus, crowd size, uh, the, the the value of his presidency, the, the 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 legislative success, and everything else. He's just it just promotes mindlessness and anti intellectuality And I think one of the ways in which this is particularly true is on the issue of trade. Now, I, I, I'm not going to get in an argument with you guys on trade because there is no argument on trade. Uh, trade is a, is a settled issue. It's a settled issue of science. It's no different than um, arguing about the existence of molecules or the existence of atoms or, 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 or uh, uh, the existence of gravity. Now, it's, it's a more complicated thing, and, and many people are ignorant of the science behind trade, but trade is a settled issue. It's been settled since, at least since Adam Smith, uh, and then uh, oh, every economist, every significant economist is a supporter of free trade. Uh, every economist, including those on the left and right, this is the one settled, one of the few settled issues in um, in economics. If you can cut deals where you lower tariffs, that's a good thing. Ideally, you would lower tariffs unilaterally to zero. That would be ideal. But NAFTA is a good thing. Trade with China, fantastic thing. You, you don't like the violation of uh, IP rights in China? Great. Boycott the companies that are violating IP rights. Make a list of all the companies and, and boycott them. They're criminal. They're, 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 they're stealing property. Fine. But trade in and of itself is not, we need to negotiate. No, every time you walk into a Walmart and you buy something, you've negotiated. You've accepted that whatever you bought, made in China, is a good deal for you because you've been willing to put up the money and accept the good. You negotiate every day when you go into the marketplace and buy and sell stuff. Trade is good. And yet, Trump announces that trade is bad. He announces he can cut better deals. He announces the deals we have are no good. No evidence. No proof. No economist agrees with him. He brings in the one economist who's anti-trade in the entire country, Navarro, from actually from UC Irvine uh, here in uh, Southern California. A hack. Not an economist. A hack. I know him. I've met him. But he's the only economist I know. Serious economist. Who, who thinks trade is a bad thing, particularly trade with China is a bad thing. And he brings him into the administration to guide him. And then suddenly, suddenly, all these people around, and this is the, the scary phenomena of Trump's presidency, all these people around me are anti-trade. It's like everybody on Facebook and everybody, everybody I encounter has... has he, all the knowledge of economics just swooshed out the window. It doesn't matter because, as I said, this is a presidency in which facts don't matter. Truth doesn't matter. Science doesn't matter. And again, I, I tell you here, this is very consistent with the academic left, where all that is true of as well. But And, and this is true, you would say, with Obama presidency. The difference is that here it's outlandish. It's upfront. It's not apologetic. It's all embracing. It's the it's the guiding principle. Now, somebody on the chat, and I've heard this a lot from people, say, "Look, Iran, this is what's needed in order to defeat the left." The the you know he lies strategically. Uh, he's a troll. I mean, that word is overused, way overused. He does this because he knows the impact it's going to have. He's a very sophisticated thinker. And he's doing this to beat down the left. Now, even if that were true, using the left's tactics to beat down the left is long-term, unbelievably destructive to America. Undercutting reason in order to defeat the left is the end of this country. If that's what he's doing. You see, I don't think that's what he's doing. I don't think he, I don't think Donald Trump is a thoughtful person. I, I mean, that's my analysis of him. He's a great marketing person. He's great at marketing. And yeah, 
he's figured that he can lie and there are no consequences. He figures that he can lie because his base will accept whatever he says. And I see it all the time. I'm seeing it right now on my YouTube chat. People accept him blindly, no matter what he does. He said early in the campaign, I mean, this was one of the most striking things he said. And the fact that it was had an element of truth to it is one of the reasons I could never vote for him. He said that he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and people would still vote for him. I mean, if that is true, and I think it is, unfortunately, then that means that facts don't matter. Reality doesn't matter. Morality doesn't matter. Legality doesn't matter. What matters is winning at any cost, at any price, no matter what, even if the truth has to be sacrificed. You're going to, you know, winning is all that matters. And when you lose, you challenge, you challenge. I mean, I, I find it interesting that Roy Moore, who Trump supported, Roy Moore lost in Alabama, uh, challenged it. It was, uh, it, you know, recount or whatever. It was certified by the court. He's still not accepting defeat. That's this primacy of your own consciousness, not of reality, not of facts, not of evidence. But whatever I want, whatever I feel like, that's what should be. I mean, Roy Moore is the ideal, the perfect uh, Trump-like candidate. And it, yeah, it, it made my day when he lost. Not that the Democrat won, but that Roy Moore lost. I mean, it's exactly that. Uh, Donald Trump can support Roy, Roy Moore. I mean, Republicans can support Roy Moore. In spite of the fact that he flouts the rule of law. And then, of course, Donald Trump pardons uh, Sheriff Arapio, who flouted the rule of law, because the rule of law doesn't matter if you don't happen to agree with the law. But God forbid, illegal immigrants. Oh, my God. They're illegal. They're criminals. Every single one of them is a criminal. Well, how, how about Roy Moore being an illegal? He flouted the law. He went against the Supreme Court. That's illegal. How about Arapio as an illegal sheriff? He didn't... He, he ignored the ruling... He ignored the ruling of a court, a court of law, and he did whatever he felt like doing. Uh, uh, where do you get off? Where do you get off? Talking about illegal anything. When, you, when it's convenient for you, you don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm an illegal driver. I've said this all the time. I speed all the time. Um... And uh, I'm sure I violate other laws. I'm sure I do. Because you know what? The legal system in the United States is so insane. It's hard not to. I want to give you one other example of, of the mindlessness. And again, this is not unique to Trump. What's unique to Trump is how much we flaunt it. And what's unique to Trump is how much he doesn't care. And how much his supporters don't care. But how aggressive he is about it. Again, Obama, Obama was anti-American. But he at least pretended. He presented a facade of reason, of intellectuality, of, of facts. Presented that. Pretended that. Um, Trump has none of the facade. He's naked in his anti-Americanism in, in his, in his, of, 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 of his actions. He's not anti-American in his speech, right? But he's anti-American in, in, in what America represents versus what he talks about. He's anti the mind. He's anti ideas. He's anti intellectuality. He's anti fact reality and so on. All right. Um, let me see. I wanted to give one more example, but I'm going to do that uh, after. Let me just say this. I think that Trump's vulgarity is part of this. Trump's vulgarity is part of this. Um, vulgarity is a form of anti-intellectualism. Uh, it's a form of anti-reason. It's the last refuge of somebody who has nothing really to say. It's, it's crude. It's ugly. And it's reflective of that. His tweets are the same thing. The fact that he condenses everything into short sentences. All of that, all of that, add it all up. All I see, all I get is irrationality, the worship, the adoration 
the normalization of irrationality. All right. We're going to be right back. Uh, we're going to take a, a quick uh, break for messages. You're listening to Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, we're back. And I think the point I was making towards the end of the last segment was the idea that Trump is normalizing the irrational, normalizing the idea of no facts, of the insignificance of reality, of the insignificance of truth, the insignificance of reason. That is the lasting, lasting damage he's doing. And and those of you who are Trumpites, those of you who seem to follow him almost blindly, that's what you're achieving. You're not destroying the left. You're embracing the left because that has been the agenda of the left all along. That's been the agenda of the postmodernists all along. And you're just embracing it. You're helping it propagate. And when you attack trade, you attack capitalism. When you attack trade, you attack free markets. When you attack trade, you attack all economic knowledge. You, you, you make it irrelevant. It's, it's all about emotion. Trade feels bad, so trade is bad. Capitalism feels bad, then capitalism is bad. You're playing right into the hand, right into the hand of the worst of the worst elements in the left and the right. Um, I want to give one other example and, and uh, related to trade, and that's this term globalism, which is this amazing package deal that so many people have bought into. And now a package deal is when you put into one concept two things that are not compatible and that class with one another, making the word itself, the concept itself, meaningless because it doesn't mean anything. Glo globalism is exactly that. Globalism means nothing. What does it combine in it? It combines the idea of um, the UN running the world, of global governance, of the UN dictating how we should do everything, or whether it's the UN or some other international organization dictating how America should be run. And in, in that package together, the idea of free trade. Now, I, for example, am a huge advocate for free trade and completely antagonistic completely opposed to world government, and I've said that the United Nations is one of the most immoral institutions in human history. I, I, am I a globalist? Am I not a globalist? Am I half a globalist? What is it? You see, you can't, it doesn't allow you to think. It doesn't contribute anything to cognition. And it's exactly what Donald Trump wants. He wants all those who are opposed to the UN to be opposed to free trade and to be trapped by this word globalist. Uh, people constantly accuse me of being a globalist because I'm for free trade. And so other people look at me and say, oh, wow, you're for government by the United Nations. You want the United Nations to control us. Uh, really? So, <laughs> anyway, so it, it, it's, 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 it's so... And again, everybody does this, but Trump does this to a higher level. To be, he's, he's really, really good at it, and he is systematically destroying, trying to destroy our ability to think about politics, to discuss ideas, because he's taken out the foundation, facts, reality, clear definitions, using terms accurately and definitively. Right? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't care if you want to call me a globalist, but just include there only free trade. If free trade is what defines you as a globalist, I'm a globalist. But if globalism means world government or world governance or UN, then I'm not a globalist. Now, I know that you guys can't handle that fact. Some of you can't handle that fact. You can't handle these two things. You can't handle that I'm pro-free trade, but against that. For you, it's all one big package deal. All right. All right, we've actually got a caller. I didn't expect that. All right, let's take this caller. Hi, uh, Brian from Chicago. You're on the Iran Book Show. Hey, Iran. Uh, yeah. Enjoy the show. I tried calling you earlier knowing I was answering your phone. Oh, well, I, uh, I have no control over that, unfortunately. That's the blaze's job. I agree job. with everything you said about Donald Trump, yeah. but I think – the point that a lot of commentators are always missing or forgetting is that Donald Trump, the phenomenon of him being in the White House, 
is more to do with the rejection of both of our established parties. Both parties are horrible. Yeah, I agree. Most people in America are not a member of either party. Most Americans despise politicians. Yep. So, you know, I remember when, when uh, Trump was wreaking havoc with the established Republicans in the primary, and they're all trembling, thinking he was going to wreck the Republican Party. He was going to go down in flames. Hillary was going to be the president. Yep. That was conventional thinking. But so many Americans despise Bill and Hillary Clinton. Because they've proven liars. I they get say one thing and do another. I get why Trump was elected. The question is here he is governing. And not only is he governing, he hasn't wrecked the Republican Party. He's actually got the Republican Party behind him 100%. They're supporting him completely. What he's done is he shifted the Republican Party to his anti intellectual tribal mentality. So he's made the Republican Party even worse than what it used to be. Now, I'm not going to argue if Hillary Clinton would have been better. To me, that's irrelevant. I don't do alternative histories. I look at the facts as they are. He is president of the United States. And the question is, what impact is his presidency having on the world around us? And that's what I'm trying to analyze. Well, he's got, he's got everything all shook up. And I think a lot of Republicans swallowed hard because they wanted that tax bill. That's what they wanted more than anything was that tax bill. And they got it. So yeah, they're happy but, for that. Yeah, now, yeah. what's going to happen in the next six months? Who knows? He could, you know, it could all blow up in their faces. And I got a feeling it's going to. I think the Republicans, it's all going to blow up in their faces. The Democrats are going to take over Congress. Trump is going to be neutered. And then all the gains they've, they've garnered are going to go away. You know, and I... I wouldn't be surprised I, if you're right. That's the I way just the public is. Yeah, I don't you know. know. Everybody likes simple little stories. Yep. And, and another big problem in American politics is television media is horrible. And unfortunately, that's where most Americans get their information yeah. is television. I, and it's, I, I, they like the quick, simple yeah. stories. They like the Trump insult of the day. That's oh, right. who did Trump insult right. today? But, oh, but it's, it's, you today? see, it's, you know, I think Trump is love. reinforcing the anti-intellectualism that is already in the American public, and he's reinforcing it, and he's playing into it, and he's supporting it, and that does not bode well for where the country is heading. I mean, I agree with you. I think this is all going to blow up in our faces uh, because this is not sustainable. It's not sustainable from Trump. It's not sustainable from the left. It's not sustainable from the Republican Party. That What we have created in this country is, is, is heading towards disaster. You know, exactly the form of the disaster, I don't know. But it ain't good. Nothing good is going to come of the Trump presidency. That I can assure everybody. All right, Brian, thanks for, uh, thanks for participating. Thanks for calling in. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you. It's, 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 it's a much broader phenomenon than Trump. Trump is the manifestation of it. Trump is one individual. But the fact that he won, the fact that people support him, the fact that even people listening to this show don't get what globalism actually means. All of that is, it just reinforces the message that we've anti-intellectual, unthinking, don't care about the facts and don't care about reality. And I think that things are going to have to get worse before they get better. And the only thing preventing it, things from getting worse is those geniuses in places like Silicon Valley who keep the economy going and without whom we'd be in a depression right now. And uh, it is um, it, it stuns me that people who who are supposedly pro-American, pro-capitalist attack the, the, the greatest producers among us, the people who actually make this country work and, and keep pushing forward, keep moving forward. Uh, I can't imagine what the world would be like if without those incredibly bus incredible businessmen. All right. Um, so. Trump, the great danger of Trump is that he's normalizing the irrational. And that what Trump has revealed is that there is a big portion of Americans who are already there, who are supportive of this, who are, who are willing to follow and, and engage in this kind of lying, manipulation, marketing in order to achieve these goals. And then the question is, what happens? And, and we already know on the left that this is what is being taught our kids. Irrationality, 
lack of facts, lack of reality, emotionalism. Now we have it both on the left and the right. And what, what is the expression? What happens to people Too when much. they lose confidence in their own mind? When they are taught that the mind is impotent, that truth, facts, reality don't matter, that the irrational rules, in a sense that emotion rules, all they have left is to cluster around in their little group and to follow the leader or to follow the majority. What you get is tribalism. The consequences of the negation of reason are always tribalism. And that's the other negative thing that the Trump presidency indicates, makes real, is how tribal we have become. How tribal we have become. And we are becoming. And Trump encourages that, supports that. But the whole left-right division in America supports that. The whole idea of identity politics on the left support that. The alt-right on the right supports it. I've never, I haven't seen uh, more racism, more racist Sorry. comments, more collectivism, more tribalism in America than I have over the last year. And I think Trump is the one who has brought that out, brought that to the forefront. All right. So when we get back, I want to talk more about this tribalism, about the danger of tribalism and why it's so anti-American. We are the land of the individual, not the tribe. All right. You're listening to uh, The Iran Brook Show. We're here on the Blaze Radio Network every Saturday, and we'll be back after these you messages. Hear traditional political All right. Happy New Year, everybody. I hope you had a great Christmas, and I hope you're having a great reflective time to think about the year that's passed and the year and, and, and the future and your life and great time to make commitments to making the, la- the world and your life a better place. You know, one of the things, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit off, but come back to tribalism. One of the things that really stands out uh, in terms of the last year is the extent to which illegal immigration has become central to almost every discussion, every debate about anything, no matter what. It, it comes up everywhere. And again, another topic that the, the kind of Republican establishment has completely bought into the rhetoric on. Now, I'm not going to debate illegal immigration here. I'll just point out that it's not that important of an issue. There are much bigger problems in this country. Individual rights are being violated left and right by the government everywhere and all the time. Uh, illegal immigration since 2007 till today has basically been flat. Uh, it was negative through much of the late 2000s because of the economy. It's never really picked up. It's never become a huge problem. Crime in the United States has been declining since 1990 as illegal immigration has been increasing. From 1990 to 2007, illegal immigration increased dramatically, and yet crime went down. And then from 2007, both crime and illegal immigration have gone down. So there doesn't seem to be a correlation between crime and illegal immigration. There's no issue. Where illegal immigration is important, it, it, you know, the, 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 the manufacturing jobs that have lost in this country has nothing to do with trade, has nothing to do with illegal immigration, has everything to do with technology. I mean, there's no issue. There's no there, there. I mean, you can argue they're illegals. They should be, you know, the law of the land. They should be deported. We should change the laws, whatever. But why is this the central issue that everybody discusses all the time whenever we debate politics? It's not that important. It's not a, a, a violent crime. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a crime. I, 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 can't, I don't know where it is on the, on the rate, rates of crime, but it's not a big deal. No rights are being violated. They haven't stabbed anybody in the back. They haven't done anything so horrific as to dominate our mental space. And yet all we can talk about, seemingly, is illegal immigration. Who cares? I mean, yeah, it's an issue. We should debate it. We should discuss it. But the centrality, the single-mindedness, again indicates both a mindlessness and a tribalism. I, I truly believe that much of the, of, the, of the emotion around illegal, illegal immigration has to do with tribalism. They're not from our tribe. Oh, my God. People are coming here and they're not from our tribe. 
Their skin color is different. They have a different culture. They speak a different language. Oh my God. My tribe is being threatened. That's un-American. And, and, and again, a, a, a turn to the worst. And, and tribalism and racism and xenophobia, um, all these things um, are much, much worse today than I can ever remember them in America in the past. I think racism and, and, and tribalism have always been under the surface there. But what the Trump presidency has done is brought them out, brought them out into the open. Right? And, 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 and I just mentioned immigration already, people attacking, oh, I never mentioned open borders. And I've discussed Israel and I've discussed Israel's walls and I've done all that. So if you want my opinion about why America is different than Israel, why Israel's walls are not that important, I've talked about that. Go find it, right? And why, you know, what I mean by open borders, nobody cares, right? It's like an emotional, it's like an emotional thing just drops over people's minds and they get completely blocked. Nothing threatens, it seems, people on the right in America today more than illegal immigrants. Oh my God, zombies are invading and they're going to kill us all. And of course, in spite of the fact that almost all illegal immigrants are Mexicans, the immediate response is the next response is the Muslims are coming. <laughs> I mean, it just shows everything I've said, the emotionalism, the, the negation of fact and reality and reason, and ultimately the tribalism, the xenophobia, the racism that I think, unfortunately and, and shockingly, is all around us. And again, the right meets the left. Identity politics, which was a leftist agenda item on all the universities, a, 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 an agenda item that emphasized race over everything else, identity as, as skin color, identity as, as cultural belonging, as ethnic group over everything else. That was the most important thing to the left. Now the right has embraced it and basically said, hey, we can play this game. Now, they're not quite as open about it as the left is. But, yeah, I mean, uh, never have the, uh, uh, not in a long time, not never, not in a long time, have the American uh, racist been as bold as they are right now. Not in a long time have American racists been as bold as they are right now. Uh, not, in a, not in a long time as a president of the United States been as you know, sympathetic to those views, or at least non-condemnatory of those views, as Donald Trump has been. Um, he, he, there's an encouragement and, a, and an emphasis and kind of a hood mentality of don't think for yourself, of, of just follow the leader, and follow what is politically correct, but on the right, and politically correct on the left. I mean, if, if the left and the right, there's nothing that the right hates more than people on the left, and there's nothing on the left that they hate more than people on the right. It's truly stunning how deep that goes, how deep it goes. Yeah, yeah there we go. I just mentioned immigration, and like masses of people came onto YouTube, and they were all talking about it. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Right? Yeah, yeah, Sharia law is not good for the U.S. Who the hell is for Sharia law in the United States? I mean, that's such a straw man. That's such nonsense, right? Nobody's for that. So, but that's, that's how quickly any discussion where immigration is just mentioned becomes. Because of how tribal we have become. Because of our inability to think because of the mindlessness, because of the irrationality, because of the, the lack of, of discussion, rational discussion, rational debate, fact-based. Everything is hysteria and panic and emotion. And that's, that's tribalism. That's tribalism. My group, that's what's important. What does my group think? Oh, I'm for that. So, it's, it's sad, it's sad. The land of individualism, the land of reason 
is now the land of irrationality and tribalism. At least, it's not gone, as I said. There's still a lot of individualism in American business. There's still a lot of rationality in American innovation. There's still the American people, for the most part, are still individualistic and, and rational. But hell, on, on the right and on the left, in politics and creeping more and more into our culture and embracing more and, or, or enveloping more and more Americans is this irrationality and, and tribalism that is, that is everywhere, everywhere. And, and there's, now, there's now racism on the left and racism on the right and no end to it. All right, we're going to take a quick break. I, I want to talk about, when I come back, I want to quickly talk about America first um, and, uh, and then maybe say something about 2018. If not, we'll do that next week. We'll talk about what I think is to come. All right, you're listening to your Run Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be right back. All right, we're heading towards the last segment of the last show of 2017. Wave goodbye to another year. Oh, my God, I'm getting old. Um, so one of the things I hear and, and uh, you know, is, is the, the idea that, look, Trump is at least pro-American. Obama was an anti-American president. I, I was one of the first to call him such. I, I called him the first anti American president uh, ever, and uh, at least Trump is pro-American. Now, my view on this is, really, is he? Not that I think he's anti-American. I just think he's neither. I don't think he knows what America is. I don't think he cares. I think he's pro-Trump in a superficial, short-term, narcissistic way. Narcissistic way. But, but look, at, look at foreign policy where he says America first. I mean, that's a joke. A joke. What about Trump's foreign policy as being America first? You mean his basic handing over of Syria and Iraq to, to our worst enemy in the Middle East, Iran, and to our only potential global enemy, the Russians? You know, what's being America first about it? We're still in NATO. We're still in the UN. And in spite of the headlines, we haven't cut our contribution to the UN. The UN just voted overwhelmingly against America. We did nothing. We didn't walk away. We didn't leave. What's America first about it? And I, 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 let me tell you what America first strategy would be. Just highlights, right? We'd leave the UN. We'd actually say that over the next 10 years, we're going to leave NATO. We'd, we'd let the South Koreans take responsibility for defending themselves against the North Koreans. We'd, we'd start on widening our treaties with them and the Japanese, let them defend themselves. Stuff that, to some extent, Trump actually said during the campaign, which was the few things that I liked that he said. Um, we would actually not just decertify the Iranian deal. We would actually negate it and deal with the Iranians. We would actually deal with the Saudis, although that might be happening in spite of ourselves. Uh, the Saudis might be reforming themselves, not because of America, but in spite of us, our weakness with regard to Iran our weakness generally in the world, I think, is encouraging the Saudis to take responsibility for their own defense and their own lives. And I think as a consequence, we might be seeing internal reform in Saudi Arabia, which, if true, would be terrific, would be really, really good news. What has been America first? Yeah, he moved the embassy to Jerusalem, or at least said he would. All right. Finally, every Republican and even some Democratic presidents have promised to do that and haven't. So he might actually do it. Big deal. Indeed, in actual policy, put aside what he says, put aside how he says it, put aside the vulgarity, the Twitter nature of the whole thing, the, the, the lying and all of that, most of what Trump has done is very conventional. The tax bill is a conventional Republican tax bill. The attempt to repeal Obamacare were not attempts to establish free market medicine in America. They were just attempt to repeal Obamacare, and even they failed. His foreign policy, it doesn't exist. You know, it's maybe better than Obama's, but I doubt it. I don't think Obama had much of a foreign policy. At least we're not apologizing to the world. I'll give him that. We're not apologizing to the world, which Obama did all the time. Say so in that sense, it's better. But it's conventional. Everything is conventional. And at the same time, any Republican would have got the tax bill passed. 
any Republican president, any one of those 12 candidates would have done tax cuts. That's what Republicans do. They don't know how to do anything else. They certainly don't know how to t- cut spending. So they, they, they cut taxes. That's the one thing they're good for. Right? So his presidency in terms of policy has been mostly conventional. I think somewhat by accident, he has appointed some good people uh, in good places on the regulatory agencies who are doing good things. But then in other places, like Jeff Sessions in the Justice Department, it's another disaster. Uh, uh, it looks like from an antitrust perspective, this is going to be a disastrous administration. So that's a mixed bag there. There's just nothing that interesting about what Trump has actually done. Just nothing that interesting. All the interesting stung is how he does it, what he says, you know, what, what he gives moral sanction to and what he doesn't. All his lies and his vulgarity and his Twitter. Action, very little and not that meaningful. Yeah, leaving the Paris Treaty, that was good. That was good. Yeah, there are there, there, there things here and there. Uh, we will see how it all pans out and we will see what, what happens, where we go from here, 2019. All right, so let me end... Let me end with some very quick. I'm not going to really get into this because I've only got, what, about six minutes to the end of the show. And this this would take a whole show to really get into it. But but let me say some things I'm worried about going into 2019 and some things, well, 2018. I've already skipped a year. I'm already at 19. I've actually got in my notes 2019. Oh, my God. 2018 is coming up. Things I'm worried about. Trump. <laughs> I have no idea what he's going to be doing. Uh, I, I, you know, the course of nature of his presidency, what impact that's going to have on America. Uh, the rule of law, which I think is tentative. Uh, Obama was very anti-rule of law. Trump is even in some ways worse. What's going to happen? What's going to happen with Russia investigation, given his disrespect of the rule of law and, the, and process and, and the, the separation of powers is going to be really interesting. You know, Bannon said that he does not believe that Trump will finish out his term. That's interesting, you know, how, how that all plays out and what kind of damage it does to the country. What happens in the midterm elections in 2018? Do the Democrats win? Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Uh, you know, if they can hold the Senate, which I think they've got a good chance of doing, and they lose the House, we get even more divided governments, even more stalemate in Washington, is that necessarily bad? I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not commenting on the Russian thing because I, 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 don't know, I don't think it's that important, but it is important in terms of the politics. It's got important political ramifications one way or the other. And do I buy, uh, people are asking, do I buy that Trump colluded with the Russians? Yeah, I believe that. I, 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 I don't rule that out, put it that way. I don't have any evidence to, to, to support it, but it doesn't strike me as science fiction. Do I think the Russians try to manipulate the US elections? Absolutely. I don't think there's any doubt about that. They do that with every country. They are known as that. Do I, do I think Putin is a bad guy? Absolutely. I think he's one of the worst people on the world stage. Do I think he would do anything to try to undercut the United States? Absolutely. So yeah, all of that. I think, uh, I think Russia's a big deal. Uh, this, you know, what's going to come of the Mueller investigation? I don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just, the fact that in the New York Times uh, interview with, uh, with Donald Trump just from uh, a couple of days ago, he, mentioned, he denied that there was any collusion, unprompted. He mentioned that there was no collusion between him and the Russian 16, 14 or 16 times. I mean... The protest too much. So, you know, I, the whole thing. Who, I mean, who cares, right? That's the least of my worries about Donald Trump. Is uh, My worries about Russia, I worry about Russia a lot. It's, 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 it's one of the really bad, bad actors in the world stage today and uh, threatens uh, U.S. interests significantly. There's a lot. There's a lot. Europe, what's going to happen in Europe? Um, I, I just have to, have to tell you the story. So in Berlin, for the big uh, New Year's Eve celebration, they're creating um, zones that are safe for women. And it's zones that if they get harassed, they can come 
and uh, and get um, and get uh, counseling during New Year's Eve celebration. Now, this is according to BBC. I mean, how bizarre is that? Shouldn't the whole of Berlin be a a safe space for women? Um, the fact that they acknowledge that it's not, the fact that they're not putting enough police out there into the crowds to make it so is pathetic. The fact that they would set up zones is pathetic. So the whole European caving to Islam is just ah, unbelievable, unbelievable. And something to continue worry about, worrying about uh, as we move into 2018 and into the future. Uh, just... Nuts! That the you know what signal does that send? The bad, the worst elements within the Muslim population. Um, it it sends the worst kind of signals. They can do whatever the hell they want. They're going to be safe zones. They can harass them in the non-safe zones, and then the women can escape to the safe zones. And then, of course, Two Europe. The backlash to that is Poland. Poland, the wonderful Poland. No, Poland's a disaster. Freedom in Poland is in decline. Freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. If Poland is in deep, deep trouble. That's not the solution. So where do you go? I mean, Europe is a mess. Europe continues to be a mess. Okay, I want to end the last two minutes on uh, some hope. Uh, most important piece of news over the last weekend, there are protests in Iran against the mullahs, against the leaders, if Donald Trump is truly an American first president, then, well, he should be on every day supporting them, not just by giving them weapons and money, but actually from the bully pulpit supporting them morally. Uh, Obama had an opportunity to do that in 2009 and did not. Campuses, free speech, there seems to be a pushback, the rise of Dave Rubin, Jordan Peterson, etc. All good things. The sexual harassment stuff is good overall, bad elements to it, but good overall in that it's bringing it to the forefront and maybe reduce its prevalence. So there's some good things. These are good things that are happening moving into 2018 that we can build on and make even better. The fight... The struggle for this country will continue. 20. Uh, and if we identify reason, if we fight for individualism, use facts and logic and science and reason, we will win. Whether it's in 2018 Ten. or 2025, the future is ours. Talk to you next year. Have a great new year. You're clear. You're listening to the Yaron Brooks Show. All right, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good luck with the move. Thank you. Great. And he's, he's drugging you. That's it. Yeah.